Great. As mentioned by the Sergeant at Arms, your mics will be muted and feel free to send me any questions in the chat and I will have them answered at the appropriate time. I have the honor to introduce our great speaker, Lance Miller. And he's a DTM, Distinguished Toastmaster. He is an award-winning speaker and trainer. He is the world champion of public speaking in the year 2005. He has delivered over 5,000 speeches in over 60 countries on public speaking, leadership, and overcoming failures and adversities. He has been very active in Toastmasters for over 30 years. He is a double DTM, Distinguished Toastmaster. And he has held almost all the club officers positioned multiple times. And he is well qualified to talk about today's topic because in 1999, he has been in the leadership team that built his home club Renaissance Speakers to 95 members. Listen, 95. I, I have to bow down to his effort. And their club became the fourth club in Toastmasters International. That's a great achievement. In addition, Lance has an extensive business background as well as an adventure background from climbing mountains, sailing across oceans, and flying over countries in the globe. And currently, he's the CEO of Terex X LLC, providing sustainable products and technologies to the industry, commercial, and marine markets. You can read his detailed in his website, www.lancemillerspeakers.com. Ladies and gentlemen, let us give the warmest welcome to our phenomenal speaker, Lance Miller, to show well, us you. how to promote uh, your Toastmasters Club. Over to you, Mr. Thank, Lance. Yeah, thank you, Tori, and uh, hello, District 101. You were the first district I ever spoke to that had three, <laughs> three numbers in it, so, uh, so congratulations. And uh, yes, I've been... Uh, been at Toastmasters, it's 30 years this year, coming up right at the end of this year, it was 30 years ago. And it was really a turning point in a lot of ways in my life. But I, I want to get into, to me, a couple of missing ingredients that I discovered in the Toastmasters program. And I think that this is at the foundation of how we're going to build the club and so how we're going to run the club, how we're going to keep it successful. And I got a couple of stories I just want to share with you. I grew up in a little town in eastern Indiana. My family had a milk and ice cream business there. And I, I say a milk and ice cream company because we didn't have cows. We called it a dairy. But every time I says a dairy, people think I had cows and I milk cows. I never milk cows. Thank God we didn't have cows. Okay. <laughs> But I uh, pick up milk on the farm. We bottle milk. We make ice cream. My grandfather started it back in the, uh, the 20s. My father was in that. I was the third generation coming into it. And as a kid, we had all these old buildings. There are a number of little churches in town had built bigger churches outside of town. So my grandfather would buy the church and use it as a warehouse. And so we had these little buildings spread around town. And when I was starting about 12 or 13 years old, my dad would say, get a crew together. You got a truck download on Saturday. And I would go down, get a couple of my buddies together, 
we'd go down and it'd be a 40 foot semi trailer backed up to one of these little old buildings in town. And I'd open the doors and it was full to the front because the last people in the company that just threw put it, put stuff in there just dumped it in. They, nobody didn't organize it. They didn't say somebody we had to put more into it. They just did it as easy as they could. They just dumped it in. So here I am 12, 13 years old with three buddies. And I go, there's no room. Where am I going to put everything? So I'd walk down to the plant and I'd get a supervisor. We'd walk back down. He'd look at it and he goes, well, we'll start pushing everything apart. And we'd have to sort the warehouse out. And then we finally goes, okay, there's your space. And we'd unload it. Well, this happened three, four, five times. And I remember finally I opened the door and I go, oh, there's no room. And I looked at walking back down to the plant to get a supervisor. And I went, screw it. Let's... Look, all they're going to do is figure out how to move things around. Let's just figure it out for ourselves. And so we started pushing everything around, and I started doing that every. It's about, usually about twice a week. I'd have twice a month. I'd have a truck unload, and that was the point where, to me, one of the first things we have to do as leaders or to be successful in life is we have to take the viewpoint. We have to figure it out for ourselves. Fortunately, it took me re years to realize the lesson I learned at twelve or thirteen years old. But when my club was formed in 89. I joined in 92, October, November, 92. And in August of 93, we had 35 members in the club when I joined. And in August 93, we had 12 coming to a meeting. Now, just, does that sound familiar to anybody? Is, just, is it just me? Okay, I just want to let you know, there's no special DNA or anything like that that we had in the club. And one, it was late August, one meeting, only five of us showed up. And we're sitting around, we're trying to decide if we're going to keep the club or not. And somebody said, if we're going to do this, I mean, we're just, we were like the five most gung-ho people in the club because we showed up. We we're the last ones. We didn't have a meeting that day. We had something we call here in Southern California, we call it coffee. I don't know what you call it in the Bay Area, but we call it coffee down here. Anyway, <laughs> we're talking and we're going, you know, what do we do? Keep the club? Do we close it? You know, and somebody said, if we're going to do this, let's win with Toastmasters or let's go do something else and win with it. But I don't want to sit here and I'm going to paraphrase this and run a hospice Toastmasters club. You know, and this is hospice Toastmasters. That's where we keep the, the members comfortable until the club dies. And there's a lot of clubs out there that are just hanging on month to month. And then somebody else said, and this was back, they had a different distinguished club program back then that I really liked because it's what really turned my club around. They said Toastmasters ranks all the clubs. And, and they, why don't we be a top 10 club? They rank all the clubs in the world. Let's be a top 10 club. And we all got excited. That would really be a cool. That would be cool. We'd really win. We'd win with Toastmasters if we did that. Now, just so you know, there's no manual that tells you how to do a, be a top 10 club. We'd never even read the manual. We didn't even know what the Distinguished Club program was. As a matter of fact, if we knew how hard it was going to be to be a top 10 club, we probably would have said we're not going to do it. But we had to figure out the first thing we had, I said, we had 12 people coming to the meeting, but we had 35 on the roster in the club. We had to figure out how to get the members back in the club. So we split them up. We all called them. And we asked a couple questions. We had to figure out why they weren't coming. And then we asked them one of the things is what did you like about coming to the meeting? And the number one thing they said is they wanted to have fun. The number two thing they said is they wanted to see their friends. And the number we got back to, you know, the number three, we just wanted to get the benefits of Toastmasters. And we went, oh, it needs to be a fun, friendly activity. <laughs> and we really had two presidents in a row that weren't fun and friendly. And our membership was dropping off like crazy. And then we had to figure out how to get people activated because in order to get the points, and we were like 7,500 in the world at that point. To get the points, we had to get everybody to get to complete a speaking level. So we had to figure out how to do that. And then we started to grow the club. And we got a lot of members in the club. And it's, we had too many members for the speaking slots we had. And we have a three-hour weekend meeting. We have six speaking slots in the club. And just, I'm not going to go over this, but if you have six slots per meeting and you have 50 meetings a year, that's 300 slots. And there's 10 speeches in every Toastmasters level back then. That's 30 completions you can get at 100% efficiency. Well, we, we needed to get like 50 or 60 completions. So we had to figure out how to get more speaking in the club. We went to two meetings a, uh, a week and we had to figure all this stuff out. Nothing in any Toastmasters manual told us how to build our club, how to make it a top 10 club in the world. We had to figure that out. And to me, the best thing we could do in Toastmasters is bring people to district trainings and saying, here are the tools, figure out how to use them. 
and then give them it's like you know those tv shows like survivor or the apprentice or something like that they get a million dollars if you get the best club <laughs> And everybody would just like go, yeah, let's go build the club. But we wanted to build the club. We had a drive. We did, had a desire to build the club. We wanted to win with Toastmasters. And when we started, not everybody in the club wanted to do that. But as we started to pick up the momentum, we started to see that the, the people started to get excited about it. And I'll just tell you, the whole club wanted to do that. It wasn't anything that just one person did. You just heard ta Pat talk about you know leadership. I really cut a lot cut a lot of my leadership teeth building that club and learning how to take a volunteer group and get them to win. And how many people have ever been vice president of education for the cameras on? Okay, we got a lot of people, good. So here's what happens in May. If I could talk to you, and if we're live, I'd talk to you, but I mean, in person. In May, you're usually begging people to finish a distinguished club pro, you know, a, a level, right? You're begging them. And they always have a nasal thing, that tone and they go, I don't know if I want to. I want to do it when I want to do it. I don't want to be pushed into it. You know, and I, I go, I just, here's what happened in my club. The members are calling the vice president of education and they're going, you haven't given me enough speaking slots to finish my CC. I'm not going to be responsible for this club not being a top 10 club. You find me speaking slots. And the VPE is calling us as a president and the other. You, these people are yelling at me. They want to get through their, 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 their DCP or their, their, their um, um, CC. CC. Thank you. They, they're, they're CC so they can get the points for the club. They wanted the club to win. And I've seen that and I've seen what can happen when you bring people together. So I, I want to let you know where, where I'm coming from this. I'm going to go over with you some ways you can bring membership into your club. But the thing I want to make the biggest thing I want to tell you is that you really got to figure out how to bring the members into your club. I'm going to give you some tools. I'm going to give you some things that we've done. A You're on mute. Thank you. What was the last thing you heard? <laughs> okay, you listen. I'm, you got to figure it out for yourself. Yeah, yeah, okay, thanks. You got to figure it out. You got to, the whole thing I want you to really look at is you got to figure it out for yourself. I'm going to give you some tools. I'm going to give you stuff that worked in my club. These are things we figured out on it. And so, the and there's a ton of ideas that we haven't used. And there's a ton of things that, 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 I, I've never even thought of and, and you will think of and how to build your club. So the first thing I want to share with you, the first thing that's required to build clubs and get membership is to have a dynamic club experience. You have to have something worthy of joining. So that means when you run your meeting, you need to run it on time. It needs to be organized. You need to run it in a professional manner. You need to have fun. It needs to be a friendly environment. You know, you, you have good speech evaluation. Now, maybe you're not there right now. We weren't, but you do the best you can with what you have. You also have, you welcome members. You're they're enthused, enthused to have people join you. But there's a thing I call the twinkle in the eye aspect with Toastmasters. You enjoy the activity and you have fun with the activity. There's an old country song by Commander Cody that said, there's a lot of things in life that I ain't done, but I ain't never had too much fun. And people are looking for a place to have fun and enjoy themselves. And the thing we know is that if you if, if you have a fun meeting and engage people in the meeting, not funny, fun is productive, fun is like lighthearted, uptone, it's not serious, it's not negative, it's positive. You have that type of environment, people want to come in. And actually what happened with my club, we hit a, we, when we hit, we passed about 40 members. We had so much energy going in the club that there was this almost organic growth in it that happened. Okay. So the first thing is you have to have a dynamic club experience. And the example I give with that is if you went to a restaurant, you got a promo piece of promo for a restaurant, you know, and you got it in the mail and you go, oh, a new restaurant down the street. You go down there, the food's bad, the dishes are dirty and the service is poor. Are you going to go back to that restaurant? No, it wasn't a good experience. Nice promo. I went in. Okay, but I'm not going back. So that's the same thing with your, with your club. It has to be something worthy of joining. And one of the things that a lot of what I've seen is that a lot of people don't join on the first time they come to the club. It's a little bit like they, they need to go taste Toastmasters a little bit. You know, we have Trader Joe's out here and Trader Joe's before the pandemic, they had the little tasting station, you know, and you can walk through and they're always giving food away. 
and I would go through and have lunch, you know. <laughs> but what thing was, I typically would go through and I wasn't planning on buying anything, but I would taste it. And sometimes I'd have to go through and they taste it. I'd taste something two or three times. They'd have it. And I'd finally go, you know, that's really good. And I would go buy it. But I had to taste it two or three times before I was willing to buy it. So I see clubs that say that if you you can't well, go, come more as three times as a guest or something like that, we let as many people come as a guest as much as they want. Come taste our club. Come try our club. Come experience it as much as you want from that standpoint. Okay, a couple uh, couple basics that we figured out on who's responsible for really building the club. Now, when I ask that in live sessions, everybody goes, everybody's responsible. And it is, everybody is responsible. But to really focus, what officers are responsible? And I do a whole thing on the different officer responsibilities and how to build the team, which is another thing we figured out in the club. It's not taught in Toastmasters anyplace else that I've seen. The vice president of membership is responsible for members, but the vice president of public relations is responsible for guests. They need to work together really closely. So the and, and it's it's one of the worst taught positions we have in Toastmasters, the vice president of public relations. They teach you to put out a newsletter, to put out a press release. And you know, it's like, no, this is a relationship with the public. Okay. So in a business, you have someone that does promotion and marketing to get people to reach for your product. Then you have a sales team that sells it. I, del I delivered this whole package on, on club building to Dan Rex and Sally New El Cohen at Toastmasters International. And Sally said this, she said, it's a wrong title, Vice President of Public Relations. So I want you to think of this. It should be Vice President of Promotion and Marketing. Now, if your vice president of PR was doing promotion and marketing, trying to figure out how to get guests to come to the club, then the vice president of membership has a guest pool to work with. Now, your club may not be organized that way. You're going to have to figure out how to work with your vice president of PR. But the two of you are responsible. The two officers are responsible for getting the guest to arrive in the meeting. And once the guests are in there, the vice president of membership now has a pool to work with and stay in communication. Just so you know, in my club, we, we track all this data. <clears throat> and we know on average, it takes six guests to make one member. So that's the ratio we work with. We want to have 10 new members this year. We got to get 60 guests in. Now, sometimes those guests, it's a repeat guest that comes in, but they may come, but it takes six guests for every new member as we track it. I'm going to share my screen here for a second, and uh, we're going to go through some Let's see, there we go. And this is an old PowerPoint, forgive me, I am busy. Dynamic club experience, we went through that. Okay, the really, and that, the dynamic club experience is winning members. It's really what we're talking about. The officers, I just went through this and marketing 101. You want people to come try the, up here, you want them to try Toastmasters. I just wanna tell you for a second how I joined Toastmasters. I had a friend of mine that asked me to come to the club eight times. Now, what if he'd only asked me seven? And I think about that quite often when I'm trying to get someone to come to my club, but he didn't go, Lance, you're a horrible speaker. You're a horrible leader. You're a pathetic example of a human being. You need to come to Toastmasters and get your life together. He didn't say that to me. And I wasn't either. He just kept saying, we had so much fun. I wish you were there. Oh, every week I'd see him. He goes, oh, I wish you were at my Toastmasters meeting. He would tell me about the table topics. He was so enthusiastic about Toastmasters. And I went to the Toastmasters meeting for two reasons. One, I wanted to see what it was that Glenn was so excited about. Number two, I wanted him to quit asking me to join the club. And the only way he was going to quit is if I went to the meeting and said, I checked it out. I'm not interested. Well, 30 years later, here I am. Okay. So, you know, okay. I'm just going to give you how to build your club. Be a pain in the ass. Okay. Thank you. That's the end of the seminar. You can go do something else if you want right now. Okay. Let's go down to some practical steps on, uh, let me see where I am here. There we go. On actions we can do to build the club. One is I say, hang out a sign. Now we're meet, meeting virtually, but this was designed for pre-COVID you know, and everything, but 
There's a lot of Toastmasters clubs that were meeting and they didn't put a sign out that said Toastmasters sidewalk, sidewalk sign or sign someplace says Toastmasters meeting inside. Now, one of the fundamental things that we know in marketing is you have to be hit with a message, I think, six or seven times before it starts to register. So you, maybe somebody mentions Toastmasters or somebody else talks about it or they get a flyer, then they see the sign. Each one of those is making an impression on the individual. So they go, oh, there's a Toastmasters meeting. I'm going to walk in and see it. And Mark Brown is the 1995 world champion. I get had a, I have a world champion speaker summit I did with all the world champions. Mark said the way he joined Toastmasters is that um, he was looking for something to do during lunch in his business. And they had a thing, come eat your lunch at Toastmasters. And so he went there to, he was brand new in the company. He'd go, I'd go eat my lunch at Toastmasters. He saw a sign. That's why, and that's a world champion. Okay. So what's this mean? It means you have your website. They can find you. People looking for you can find you. Social media, meetup. The last thing I want to talk about is email. And just so you know, I'm going to go fast here because I want to get to some Q&A with you. So I'm trying to take this much information and pack it in about this much time. We have an email list. We never take anybody off our email list unless they ask us to. And I, I, again, 30 years, I got stories for everything. We had a lady about eight years ago came to our club and she said, we asked her to stand up and tell us how she found out about the club. She goes, well, I, was, I was here 12 years ago and I've been meaning to come back. And we all, we were like jaw drop. What? And then she looked at it. She goes, I've been busy. <laughs> and, and then we're still, but I mean, my club is, my club is rowdy. And we're like, you've been busy for 12 years. And she said, my, my youngest son just graduated from high school. Now I'm looking at what I want to do. For 12 years, she was raising her kids. For 12 years, she was getting her email every week going, oh, I want to go back there. I want to go back there. Now, look, there's a few people on this call that are like me that don't have a full head of hair. 12 years goes by like that. Okay, so don't take them off your email list. Keep emailing. If they ask you, take them off. The next thing you can do, oh, uh, our, see, we send out two emails a week. We send out the pre-email, excuse me, announcing the meeting, and then we send out a little newsletter with the speakers and some quotes after the meeting so everybody knows what they missed. Okay, that's one of the things we do. Uh, card and flyer distribution. I have... I don't know if you can see it. I have I use four by six cards on a lot of things. So we had we found this was better than business cards. We found it was better than eight and a half by eleven flyers. The flyers get thrown away because it's just trash, it's paper. The business cards got tucked away. The four by six cards seemed to work pretty well, and we would invite people to the club, give them all the information about our club on it, and it was this nice sort of heavy thing that they could hang on to. And every club services a geographic area. So what I would recommend if, now we're virtual now, but when you get back to meeting in person, if you canvas the area like two or three blocks around your club, there's every, there's all sorts of people that would want to join a communication leadership program. You know, if you have a Ralph's down the street, you know, there's, and again, I, I go into great detail on these things, but the person in the Ralph's that needs Toastmasters is the stock boy. Because he doesn't want to be a stock boy the rest of his life. <laughs> the manager probably doesn't need it that much, but there's people there that want to develop their skills. There's a McDonald's. Go to McDonald's because they don't want to work at McDonald's for the rest of their life. Give them a card. Say, come to Toastmasters and learn your communication leadership skills to advance yourself. Friends and coworkers. Would be a, a lot of the... Uh, um, we do a survey every two years in my club to say, where did you... How did you find out about the club? I think... 80 or 90 percent of the members in our club were invited by a friend that's that's the biggest way that people got in yeah we have some people more a little bit now coming in on meetup you know some on virtually saw us on facebook or something like that but almost everybody was had a personal invitation so have something you can promote your club with and hand you can hand somebody something that they'll hang on to and is well designed is interesting you got to figure that out how to do it that's what we did the third thing is uh, we would have special meetings. And this is the simplicity. Instead of inviting them to a meeting, I want you to come to one of our meetings. Would you, could you come to a meeting? Invite them to the meeting. And if Elon Musk was speaking at your Toastmasters club, you think you could get some guests to arrive? Probably, because you had this special, it was only one time, as they say, sell the sizzle, okay? But you're having a special meeting and go, oh, there's a special meeting. I need to attend this one. So there's a motivation to attend this meeting. 
Now you can do all sorts of special meetings. So this meeting topics, you can do networking skills, how to introduce a speaker, lecture, lecturing etiquette, PowerPoint presentations, how to do an elevator pitch, how to prepare a speech, opening body and conclusion. People don't know this. I do lunch and learns for like the Chamber of Commerce and have people write a speech at their table and get it and give it. Opening body conclusion, opening three points in the body conclusion. That's your speech. And they go, oh, they have this huge win. People, the simplest things we know in Toastmasters. You know, thinking on your feet, you have a special meeting on how to, how to answer impromptu questions. Show a video of the world championship top three speakers in Toastmasters. We're going to show the video. You've got to come to this meeting to get guests in there. Club speech contest. I can't believe how many people would come to our club to our sports for a speech contest. Guest. Maybe it was because they weren't going to be asked for table topics. I don't know. Okay. Then you also have special guest speakers. All your district um, competition winners should be invited to your club and you promote them coming to the club. Okay. We have the Funniest person in District 101 speaking at our club. You got to come to the club. We have the person who's going to go on and to be the in the world championship of public speaking. You've got to come to the club and hear them. It gives an, a necessi- a, an urgency for them to come. There's accredited speakers, there's district speakers, and there's world champion speakers. I do a lot of club events, but I require a special event. You know, I don't want to, I don't need to speak to eight people. But just so you know, some of the things I've done, I got this was a TED Talk uh, program I did. Uh, this was another communication series program. Where had, these are clubs that we did them for. This was a club down in Orange County. They had, I think, 50 members. And I said, you have to put on a special event for me. And they go, we have 50 members. I said, I don't care. You got to put on a special event. You got to invite everybody in the district. To be, I'll come speak at your club. They rented a venue and they had 250 people with a dinner and an auction at the venue with a three camera shoot for me. And they teamed up with another club. That club had such a win on putting that on. Their membership grew. It was fantastic. They did it again six months later. They said it was the best thing they ever did because it got them out of their comfort zone and got them to create something um, on it. But there's, again, they figured out how to do it. Now, here's what, so here was another surprise. Events and parties outside of Toastmasters. Okay. People don't know what Toastmasters is, but they know what Halloween is. Or they know what the Super Bowl is. Right, So we'd have parties at somebody's house and we'd invite our friends over. Every time we had a party, we would have guests at our meeting the next time because they met everybody in the club and they went and we would play table topics at halftime. We'd have fun at the meeting, but they go, what a fun group of people. There's that word again, fun. They would come to the club because they went, no, I met all these people over at the Super Bowl party. I wanted to see what this is about. So we would typically do five or six parties a year. And we didn't do them to to begin with to get members. We did them because we had fun with each other and we invited and enjoyed inviting our friends. But I said, you'd be in the, be a Halloween party and you'd be sitting in the kitchen with the great pumpkin and a ghost talking about how do you know Sally, you know? (laughs) I go, I'm in Toastmasters. What's this Toastmasters things I keep hearing about? All these people are Toastmasters, you know? So let's look at this. You got the 4th of July, Labor Day, Halloween, Thanksgiving, Christmas, Hanukkah, whatever whatever you want, New Year's, Super Bowl, St. Paddy's Day, Kentucky Derby, Memorial Day, or just have a wine and cheese party at somebody's house every other month. Okay, go to Trader Joe's, get some two buck chuck, get some cheese, invite people over to learn how to speak after drinking. It's a very important skill set to learn, okay? (laughs) But here's what happens. They come over, you give them some wine and cheese. Maybe you have somebody give a speech. You give a table topics. You have a little get together, and you say, "We'd love for you to come to our club and just visit the visit the club." Now they're guilty because they drank your wine and they eat, they eat your cheese, and they're obligated to come to your club. You you pulled them in. I've been to a lot of these. I've I've built clubs with these. They're actually a great little mechanism. Having people don't know what Toastmasters is, but they know what wine and cheese is. So they're more comfortable coming to a wine and cheese party than they are a Toastmasters party. Okay. Um, let's see. Speech crafts. You know, the speech crafts are coming back. I, I'm trying to remember where I saw you get some credit for them. We, we, they used to be part of the Distinguished Club program. So we got points for doing speech crafts. And those of you that don't know what it is, it was in the, I have to look at the new one, but the old one was the first six speeches only in the CC manual. And it was about a six week program. And we would usually have six or eight people do a speech craft. But what we would do is we'd have them give the last speech at the club. And a lot of times the reason the person wanted to do the speech craft is they were too nervous to come to the club. 
or they um, they didn't want to get involved like joining a gym for a year. They just wanted to do a short course to learn how to speak. And what they learned was they had wins on the speech craft, but they realized it's like taking a six week exercise class. And then you realize I'm in better shape, but I need to continue to do this. So you join the gym at that point. So we'd usually get about half the people that did the speech craft join the club. And the way we did it, again, we figured this out for ourselves. We'd charge them like 35 bucks to do the speech craft. And then if they joined the club, the $35 went to the club for their membership. Okay. And they had to give their last, last speech in front of the club, which got them to the club. And they had a huge win on now they feel they're part of the club. Those are things we figured out. And we had a very good um, conversion rate of speech craft attendees to club members. And so we'd run about three speech crafts a year back when we were building my club. We don't run many right now, but I think it's a great great opportunity with the Chamber of Commerce or the Salvation Army. There's all sorts of people you can run speech crafts with. Then speaking to groups outside the club. I speak outside the club a lot, tons. I mean, I'm active in Rotary. I'm active in the National Speakers Association. I'm active in the Boy Scouts. I'm, I'm part of the Adventures Club of Los Angeles, uh, Chamber of Commerce. And so I'm constantly speaking outside the club. And at social, you know, community groups and whatnot. And I, I, a lot of times I'm introduced as a world champion speaker in Toastmasters, or I'll talk about using the Toastmasters program to develop your skills. Every time I do that, I have people come up going, you know, I really need to get in Toastmasters. I need to, I have a hard time getting in front of a group. Okay. So if you go out, let's look at this Rotary, Kiwanis, Lions Club, Optimus Club, Sir Optimus, the Moose Lodge. Now, I never thought much about the Moose Lodge, but <laughs> there's 16,000 Toastmasters clubs in the world. There's 16,000 Moose Lodges in the world, okay? So that's about the same size as Toastmasters. And Chamber of Commerce, all good places to go out and speak and teach what we learn in Toastmasters, and you'll get people to come in your club if you do that. Now, you need to send a good speaker out to do that. You can't send somebody who is who isn't a good example, okay? So the other thing I would just talk, what's my last thing here? Okay, promotional actions. Okay, website, social media, email, cards and flyers, specialty meetings inside the club, events outside the club, speech crafts, and community, you speak to the community groups. Now, my feeling is if you did three of those, you'd, you'd probably get two new members a month. Let's just say this, every other month, you do a specialty meeting in the club and every other month on the other month, you do a, a wine and cheese outside the club. So you do six of those each year. So every month you have a special event and you're doing stuff to actively promote your club at that point. Now, one of the things that I know is that because I've watched this, there's a lot of people I'll talk to about Toastmasters and they're like, yeah, yeah, and I need to do it. I'm busy. I don't know anybody that says, you know, I, I got an extra two hours I don't do anything with during the week. I might want to want to fill Toastmasters in with that. <laughs> Most people, it's like, I got to squeeze it in. But here's what happens. And here's why it's important that we're always, always promoting our club is that somebody will get up to speak and they will choke. And if that is the worst feeling you can have is standing in front of a group of people and you can't get the words out. You're so nervous. You, 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 I literally go blank. I've experienced it, not for years, but I've experienced it. You can't shut me up now, but that used to choke me up. And when somebody experiences that, they never want to experience it again. And I can't tell you how many calls I get from people that said, I just had to give a toast at a wedding and I told I need to get into Toastmasters. I totally choked. I never want to do that again. Or I, I had to give a eulogy. I had to read a prayer at church and I couldn't do it. You know, it's like, I, it was like these things, they get up and they they just, they had to make an announcement at Rotary and, and it, it was horrible. And it wasn't that bad but to them because they know what's going on inside of them. It was horrible. They never want to experience it again. We need to be there when they fall. And that's, you need to be there to catch them when they fall. That's why it's important to keep talking to your friends and going on and do this stuff because there will come a time where they hit the wall and we need to be there for them and say, yeah, come on in the club. We're going to work that out for you. So we got about 25 minutes left. So that's the, the main things I want to go over with you. 
these are things we figured out. There's more things to figure out. The big thing is, is you take the attitude that I'm going to figure it out and we're going to try things until they work. And I have one more story I want to tell you. It was 1999. I was doing an internet startup. We're trying to get the club up. We were number 14 the year before. We're trying to get, we're trying to get over that number 10 barrier. And we have a vice president of marketing who comes at Easter dressed like little Bo Peep. And she's got this bonnet on and this thing. And she's got this big basket full of green plastic Easter eggs. And she goes prancing around the meeting going, take some Easter eggs, take some Easter eggs. And I'm like, all right, all right this, this is stupid. I can't believe, oh God, I can't believe she's doing this. I grabbed three Easter eggs and put it in my briefcase. I get to work on Monday and I open my briefcase and there's the three Easter eggs. And I go, oh God, that's, a, I, I'm, that's the stupidest thing I ever saw in my life. And I put the Easter eggs, I was doing an internet startup at the time. I put the Easter eggs on three of my salespeople's desks. Two of them came to the meeting and one joined. <laughs> what she had, she had a little chocolate kiss in there. When you open it up and an invitation to come to Renaissance speakers, two of them, three Easter eggs went out, two came to the meeting, one person joined the club. And I went, I bit my tongue at that point because I thought it was the stupidest thing I'd ever seen. It worked brilliantly. So I learned such a valuable lesson of we don't know if it works until we try it. And I've had brilliant ideas that just fell flat. So, you know, we're figuring it out. How do you figure it out? You try it. You see if it worked. Maybe it partially worked. You tweak a little bit. This is the game to actually build the club. So let's do this. Tori, if you would take any questions and give them to me, and I'll take the next 25 minutes and we'll have some dialogue, which would be fun for me. Or Doris, not, not Tori. I'm sorry, Doris. Sorry. I mixed your first name and your last name. So, Doris, can, Doris, as the moderator, can you read the questions to me on the chat? Sure. Did you try to unmute me on purpose? Actually, I have an unmute all, but I want um, Kartik Gupta to raise the question herself because. Okay. Yeah. The other thing we can do is if you want, you can raise your hand and I'll just call on you and go down the list. So you'll pop up right up there. So ra raise your hand, you'll pop up. No, and, no, no. Uh, but uh, Car uh, yeah, Kartik, go ahead, ask your question. Me. Hi, hi, Lance. Uh, this is Kartik. Thanks for the meeting and very wonderful and informative um, talk. So my question is, for example, like in Pat's speech, right? She appropriately showed us in terms of percentage involved in communications. Hi, are you still there? So, I'm here. Yeah. So maybe let's say 8% is what words make up roughly. That's what I captured. And 32% is coming from vocal variety. And 60% is coming from body language, right? And these days, most of the Toastmasters clubs that at least I have attended over here on the West Coast in California, US, are virtual. And are we losing out in that 60% of the body language? I, I believe so. And, you know, in terms of helping the existing members improve, but also in terms of attracting the guests, uh, how can we leverage better the virtual meetings environment for the existing members and guests, if not directly improve one another's and the guests' body language part of the communication? Then how can we focus on the rest of the 40% say words and the vocal variety? Thanks. Okay, so uh, good, good, good question. First of all, uh, virtual or hybrid is here to stay. And my question is, did I have body language in this speech? Did I have body language in this speech? Yeah, I have body language in this speech. You have body language when you talk. The other thing is, uh, no disregard to Pat, I don't agree with a lot of this stuff that words are 8%. You try to give a speech with no words and think you're going to get 92% duplication. No, you won't. Yes. <laughs> that doesn't work. Okay, but here's the thing. Body language works in virtual just the same way it works on stage. We need to work with virtual. Virtual is here to stay. It is not going away. We're still live human beings communicating with live human beings on the other end. It is more difficult to penetrate a digital environment than it is in a, a live environment because you, you don't have that human connection right there okay but i think if you if you're listening to me and you're just watching i have body movement i have vocal variety i have inflection i also have intention 
I have life energy, all these things. I teach a whole different component on having conviction and passion and sincerity and humility in your words. And that's what drives your words with it. There's a lot of studies that are done by famous professors that couldn't speak or lead their way out of a wet paper bag or talk about certain percentages and stuff. I, I, I'll just tell you what I figured out for myself. But yes, the virtual environment is as <clears throat> needed in Toastmasters today as standing on stage. And we have to figure out for ourselves how to make it work for the person winning. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do, because I know that uh, Doris is, probably has people in chat. So I'm going to ask for, um, we've got Doris, I see Tuck, uh, what is it, Tuckett, uh, the Sergeant at Arms has her hand up. And then we'll go back over to to uh, Doris and um, and have her get a chat question. So Doris Tuckett. Thank you, Lance. I'm not used to having so many Dorises in one group, so it's quite it's funny. <laughs> I'm usually the only one. I'm a member of two strictly online clubs. One being a specialty specialty club, Toastmasters in the Kitchen in Las Vegas. Can you give me some tips to draw in members, especially when you are strictly online? Thank you. Sure. Well, it's just like, again, I'm going to say you have a market and there's a lot of people. There's a lot of people that don't want to get in the car and drive down to the meeting place and park and, you know, have to go in. They like being able to sit down at their desk, turn it on. They can, you know, during the break, go stir their soup and come back. There's a lot of people that want to do that. The biggest thing I've seen is trying to figure out where those individuals are so I can reach them to get them invited in. And all I can tell you is I don't have that nailed other than the fact that there are meetup groups, there is social media, you know, the, the postings on that, but also talking to your friends, talking to the people you know, and promoting it personally to the people that you know. My experience is in general, when I talk to people in Toastmasters, again, 80, 90% came in, not because they read an article in the newspaper or they saw a magazine ad or they saw uh, an online uh, flyer or banner on a website. Somebody invited them to the organization. That's how most people get in. And so that's what I'd recommend is see who you can just call and say, I want you to come tune in and just, you know, invite, send your link out onto your friends and email, you know, on the thing and say, here's a link. I'd like you to join us on our Toastmasters Club. It's be a lot of fun. Just come as a guest. See what you can do with that. Okay, Doris, the moderator, do we have somebody in chat that wrote you a question you want to share with me? Yes, we have uh, Deanna Mockery. I see her there. She's also got her hand up. So Deanna, do you want to ask the question? Uh, she has to type it in, please. Okay, well, just unmute and ask it. That's fine. Yeah, David Lim. It's okay, I, I, I've got those right in line here. So Deanna, do you wanna ask the question? Unmute and ask the question if you wanna ask me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. She said it's very I, I'm, good. I'm having, a, yeah, I'm having a hard time understanding you. So if you want to type it in to Doris and then the Doris will read it for you, okay? So David Land, what's your question? Thank you, Lance. I really, uh, I'm a, a new vice president of membership for my club, Silver Tongue uh, Cats. And I would like to ask you a question about the, your comment about emails, e uh, email list. Our, um, so usually we send out an agenda every week, and uh, I, I like the idea of uh, you know doing it twice a week for one for a newsletter, right? Are you uh, are you suggesting that uh, we are? Uh, I mean, it's better if we have two separate uh, distribution list. One is for uh, members that are current, and the other one is for everyone else. Yeah, Thank I would you. do. A, I, that, yeah, that's what I would do is I would have, you know, all your guests that have come, they would get the agenda, they would get the notice on the meeting every week, but you still have your club agenda, you, you, you wouldn't want to mail out club business to all your guests, you want to promote the meeting to your guests. Okay, but you promote the meeting to the guests every week. And what we have is just a flyer, we don't necessarily send the, the agenda comes to, for the people at the meeting, we, 
we put a flyer out on here's the all of our meetings are themed. Now, this is my club. Your club may be different. All of our meetings are themed. And so um, and we look at what the day is like th this uh, this weekend. It's National Mutt Day. So we have a, a Toastmasters doing a theme called Dog Tales, except it's T-A-L-E-S. Right. So it's stories about dogs. And so the table talk weeks will all be about dogs. So the whole meeting thing is on dogs. But that goes out to the whole the whole guest list. I mean, the whole yeah, the whole guest list. And then right before the meeting, usually the day before the meeting, the agenda comes out from the Toastmaster. OK. And Janal, is that, is that Jamal, George? Yeah. Yes. Uh, Lance, yes, I have a question. What if you're really shy in promoting? And how do you get over the shyness? And what what is it that'll help a shy person promote? Well, starving is a good way to do it. So, uh, what and what I mean by that is you have to decide whether you want to have a successful club or not, right? And it's like it sort of comes down to. There's all sorts of things we have reservations on, and you sort of got to get a hold of your bootstraps and go, I'm either going to succeed at this or I'm going to fail. I'm going to go live in a hole and not talk to anybody. So you're shy. God bless you. Um, there were certain things. I'll tell you the biggest, the biggest shyness I had. I had five sisters. Okay? I had two older sisters and three younger sisters. Talk about somebody that was scared to death to go up and talk to girls when I was in high school. But I wanted to talk to girls. Okay. I had to learn how to do that. Okay. And you see that red background? That's how red my face used to be because I'd walk out, I blush like people. And it wasn't until I was a junior in high school that I found out the girls thought it was cute when I blushed. And I went, oh, it's an asset. I thought it was a terrible liability. But the point is, you you had to take a step, take somebody with you. Have somebody go with you that would do it. Sit down and drill it and practice it. You know, figure out what you're going to say, know what you're going to say, come up with a pattern you're going to say on it so that you're not sitting there going, oh, what am I going to do here? You know, or anything like that. It's like, just you got to figure out what do I have to do to get over my shyness? But the first thing is you have to want to get over your shyness and not, it's not going to go away just by you meditating in your living room or, or getting old. There's plenty of old shy people. Okay. You, you got to work on it and making you make, you can, you can get over it. Okay. So uh, Joyce Howard. Yes, thank you very much. Two quick questions. The first question is, I like your idea about the guest list. My question is, do we have to have our guests, do you, would you suggest them register to come to the meeting? No, we just have guests come, but we ask them for their email so we can stay in touch with them. When we had that, we had the, the in, guest we had list person meetings, saying. they signed the guest book and we got the data. Okay. Right, but right now we're, but right now we're virtual. So, so our vice president of public relations chats the guest person and says, we'd like to stay in touch with you. Can I have your email, you know, maybe phone number in the chat? So we had to figure out how to do that. It's not. And again, I want you to say this is not a this is what you're supposed to do. This is what we're figuring out how to do so we can maintain the relationships you know, with, with the guests. So the big guest comes in, we chat him and say, welcome. We, we stop, we, when a guest comes in, we stop, what, then, you know, the next transition, we have them introduce themselves, where they're from and how they found out about the meeting. And then we ask them what they thought of the meeting at the end. And uh, so if you're interested, you're welcome to come back as much as you want. And please give your email address to our vice president of membership or our public relations so we can send you information on their next meeting. You know, and then they, we get their email, then we can be in touch with them. Okay, so. thank you. Good. Okay, David yeah. Bao. Lance, the end, the end I was saying she went to the Moose Lodge in 1987, and she had also speech crafts, you know, for the, uh, and now she's using body lang language with her face, you know, so she's making Excellent. it. Excellent. Excellent, Deanna. Excellent. That's fantastic. So David Yao done. I can't see what the rest of it is there. Go. Unmute and let's get your question. I, I just have a couple of comments to make. I love the presentation. I love the ideas coming out. And I want to say as far as being shy, the, the girl was just saying she's shy. I'm sure she's not shy in her family and I'm sure she's not shy with her friends. Every person you meet is a potential friend. So if you can talk to your friend without being shy, you can talk to anybody. Lance, 
you're my new yeah. best friend. I can talk you to you. <laughs> the exactly. other thing I want to make, the other thing I want to make a comment about is virtual meetings. They're a great new tool. They're a new tool for communication. Stand instead of sitting. Right now I'm standing. You get more energy when you stand if you're worried about gesturing or something. Stand like you would giving a regular presentation. We cannot make excuses for virtual lethargy. Oh, Very it's good. on it's online. I can't. And a lot of companies are now using virtual interviews. And we need to train for it. We need to train other people for it. Because if you're afraid of doing a virtual interview, well, you might not get into the corporation you want to. No, Anita, that's uh, very, very good points. That's what I say. Virtual is here to stay. We need to learn how to use it and be effective with virtual. So, David, did you have something? You have a question? I need you to uh, unmute and ask the question there. Yes, I do. Thank you very much for the opportunity, man. We have a social media platform. Uh, we have Facebook. We also have uh, Twitter and then Instagram, but all of them have been very dormant for since I think the last time they posted some information there was 2016 or 2011. What must I do? I am now the current VPPR for the club. What must I do to keep the site active and to engage more members? And my second question is, the community is on WhatsApp. What must I do as a VPPR every day or weekly to keep, to keep the community engaged? Okay, let me just address those. First, I'm not a social media expert, don't claim to be, but I do know this, the frequency of communication and what keeps is what keep people engaged and relevant communication. Okay, not talking about soap bubbles or, you know, uh, whatever. It's like relevant communication with what's going on. So you put meaningful information out. I've got a lot of different social media groups that I'm because of the amount of organizations I'm in and some of them are all people, you know, it's all people responding going great. I love that. That's wonderful. You know, and I get 50 freaking texts or 50 emails coming through with responses to something. What I'm looking at, you need to just have consistency with like every other day or something like that, you're posting something. So you're engaging people on a consistent basis and it's relative communication on a subject matter that would that they would find interesting in some capacity uh, from that standpoint. I, I will also say, I don't think you're going to build the base of your club relying on Facebook and Instagram and WhatsApp. You're gonna do it through personal relationships and personal contact with people and inviting people on that. So let's move on over to my cousin, Henry, and see if he's got um, Thank you. What, what, what Henry's got there. Yeah, Lance, you spoke expensive, uh, about you, the use of cards and how effective they are. Um, can you recommend, uh, what do you use? I mean, how, uh, the, is there a company you use and how costly well, is it? We've had different ones. We got, usually get them printed online. There's a lot of, you know, four by six card pretty inexpensive to get a thousand cards printed online or 2000 cards printed online. And again, I think we had some people in the club that had graphic design capabilities. So we didn't have to pay for a designer. We had pictures and, uh, you know, put it together, but uh, it was actually putting a little team together to create a promotional club that, that we were a promotional card that we were, we were happy about. And then we would give them to all the members. And so they had something to pass out at work or give to their friends, you know, they could talk to them about and they, carry them in the car. I carry them in my briefcase. And when I meet somebody, hey, well, I'd like you to come to my Toastmasters club, you know, and it, it makes it a little easier. You don't have to sit there and talk to them for 20 minutes about Toastmasters. You can give them an invitation on it. But there's plenty of opportunities out there, Henry. I mean, there's a ton of online printing now. There's overnight prints, Vista prints. Uh, there's all there's all sorts of printing companies you can get stuff printed up at. So, all right, great. Tam Lee. Yes, thank you so much, Lance, for being here with us. I have a question about getting people back to Toastmaster. So my club, we are able to recruit new members. And for the first few meetings, they, they, came, they came, they was very enthusiastic. And then a couple of months later, they are missing in action. And we call them, we follow up with them and they say life get in the way. So how do we keep them you know, going and call them back. Good, good points. It's a good point. 
it's a whole other seminar, but what I have experienced is that they're not finding the value in the time they're spending with you. And they're finding other things have higher value to them. And so they're not telling you, oh, just life got busy. What the, life got busy because it wasn't a priority. They're not getting the benefit out of the experience to go there. Now that may, without knowing anything about your club, without knowing how it's run, if that's consistently happening, they're coming in, they're enthusiastic, and then they drop off because they're not getting the benefit of the organization. And I'm just going to say, well, I was president for the third time in my club last year, and we had two things hit us. We had COVID and Pathways hit us at the same time, and I put them in both in the same bucket. We didn't ask for either one of them. We got to figure out how to deal with them. Um, what I knew was that when I was running the club before, if I could get my members to do 10 speeches, they were winning with Toastmasters because throughout the year they did 10 speeches. So I put together what I called a competent renaissance speakers program where they agreed to do 10 speeches. They did coached, we call it coaching or speech evaluation 10 times. They were a functionary five times and they were table topics master, general evaluator and uh, toastmaster one time during the year. That was 28 positions that they agreed to do. Every one of my members except one agreed to do that. And so I was driving them on a year long program to make sure they got the benefit of toastmasters. So one of the things I would recommend is when those new members sign up, say, we want your commitment that you will get through X number of speeches this year, that you'll do this, because the only way you're going to get the benefit of this program is to do it. And that means not speaking, not only speaking, that means learning how to evaluate and learn, learning the functionaries of timing and learning how to listen by being a grammarian and an awe counter and learning how to run a meeting by being a Toastmaster and learning how to evaluate a meeting by being the club. The, uh, general evaluator and learning how to handle and come up with clever questions and engage people in conversation by being table topics master. It's a full program you learn. You only get the benefit if you do it. So I get people to do the entire program and all the soft skills you develop that if they think they're just going to come in and write two or three speeches and be a great speaker and that's all they're going to contribute, they're going to drop out because they're not getting the benefit. So I, you know, there's, there's a, there's, that's a whole other talk, which I could go into. So and uh, is it Ann Shear? Is that right? Hi, and thank you very much, Lance. I am the new VP PR for my club. And I actually got on YouTube. This is just kind of information. Uh, I recently got on YouTube and looked at various promotions, things that caught my eye. Because like David, um, the persons or, or a lot of people prior to me being VPPR weren't getting the word out. And Facebook, Meta, whatever it is now, um, LinkedIn and a lot of these social medias will allow you to put articles in and schedule them. So I've put um, that one a reminder in for the entire month of August with some photos that were taken fun photos from like last year in August where we did some summer fun things and then I put the captions under them and I put photos with them so I think that might be helpful David to let them know that there are schedules in each one of those social media platforms and there's also uh, the WordPress oops I'm sorry I see the red I'm done <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, we've got we're time for, I think, one more. So is it Mega? I've got to ask you the last question. Okay. How do you motivate your members to work together with you? Usually the, the burden only falls onto one or two people. Well, the one, you have to keep people engaged. And that means you have, to, you have to build a culture that they're on a team. And it takes all the players on the team to make the team work. And that means that we expect you to be active. We expect you to speak. We expect you to coach. We expect you to be, you know, functionaries. We expect you to be table topics master. If you're joining this group, we expect you to be active in it because we want you to get the benefit of the group and the only the activity. And the only way you can get the benefit from the activity is to do the activity. So if, if people come in and they just sit and they don't participate, um, we're talking to them about you need to, you know, you need to step up and be active in the group. And what happens is they start to win with Toastmasters. And once they start to win with Toastmasters, they get enthusiastic about the benefits they're getting and their life is improving and they feel better about being in the group. But you have, you, 
create, you have to create a culture of engagement, a culture of activity that you expect from your members. And this isn't a part, this is not a spectator sport. You don't sit on a bench and watch Toastmasters. You're active in the game. That's how it works. Thank you so much. And I really enjoyed your session. There's a lot of uh, great tips that we can practice so that we can build all our Toastmasters club, not to 95, uh, if we can do it. To we're, we're at 95 now. We're, we're, we're at 35 trying to get to 50 again. So uh, anyway, I, yeah, but thank you, Doris. And thanks, everybody. I, Meg, I'm sorry I didn't get to you. But um, uh, the whole deal is the only, stand, only thing standing in between us and our success is us. And we got to figure out how to make that work. Toastmasters is an imperfect program. They give us tools. We got to figure out how to swing the hammer. Go swing your hammer and build your club. Okay. Thank you. So Thank you much. so much. And chat chair. Thank you.